Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within London's West End. Today's episode is about Louis Voisin, an experienced butcher who could kill a cow with a single blow, a conniving love rat who carefully juggled his two mistresses, and a romantic soul who would do anything for the woman he loved. But which one did he love? Murder Mile is researched using the original police files. It contains moments of satire, shock, and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds, so that... No matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 63, Louis Voisin, The Love Rat, His Ladies, and The Bloody Belgian. Today... I'm standing on Charlotte Street, W1, one street north of the infamous Charlotte Street robbery, three streets east of the Black Eyed Ripper's third victim, Margaret Lowe, one street west of the deathbed of 14-week-old Charlie Chergwin, and between Hyde Park and Regent's Park, where two terrorist bombs caused two innocents to die who weren't even there. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Situated in Fitzrovia, a supposedly fashionable district just north of Soho, Charlotte Street stretches almost the entire length of this square mile, running parallel to Tottenham Court Road. But unlike the funky seedy filth of Soho's old Compton Street, Charlotte Street is dull, grey, drab and bland. As a long straight road, with flat-fronted townhouses on both sides, Charlotte Street is only busy three times a day, when the commuters arrive, leave, and pop to Pret. Then suddenly, it's swarmed with advertising arseholes, all waffling on about how their projects are on-brand, dynamic, and game-changers, and TV tosspots daring to call themselves creatives, when all they do is pick random words from a hat and loudly exclaim, Huzzah! That's our new TV show! Celebrity Chef Patio Makeovers on Ice! Oh my god, I am a genius. Pay rise, please. But for the rest of the time, the street is dead. Set near the north end, 101 Charlotte Street is entirely demolished. As being a construction site, a sea of men in high-vis vests stand around doing diddly squat as they supervise one dude doing some digging. All under a sign which proudly reads... No accidents for 140 days. Which ironically was the last time that they weren't on a tea break. And yet they are unaware that this was the site of a brutal murder and dismemberment. As it was here on Wednesday the 31st of October 1917 that French butcher Louis Voisin would make a fatal decision which would drive one mistress to insanity and the other to her grave. Louis Voisin loved women. Born on the outskirts of Paris in 1875 and raised in a decent working-class household to a butcher father, a housewife mother and three younger sisters, Louis-Marie Joseph Voisin loved the attention of women, whether family, friends, school chums or colleagues. Oddly, he never married. But rarely being single, Louis always had a girlfriend, often had a mistress, and as if his love life wasn't hectic enough, he sometimes had a second mistress. But he wasn't a wealthy playboy, a sexy stud or a dashing gigolo with chiselled features, sharp suits and a six-pack. No, Louis was a butcher who looked, dressed and smelt like a butcher. 
In fact, as a short but stocky man, with big arms, thick legs, a fat neck, a bulbous nose, and a large round gut, being an employee for Messrs. Dring, Looney & Co., a sausage merchant at Smithfield Market, he looked as you'd expect a sausage butcher to look. And although, with a ludicrously large handlebar moustache, he seemed as if he dabbled as a part-time opera singer in the local pubs, he didn't. Louis was a butcher, and a good one too. Being a large man with powerful arms, Louis could fell a fully grown cow with a single blow, instantly putting it out of its misery, and as a skilled executioner of livestock with a solid knowledge of anatomy, each single swipe with his axe would precisely hit the joint, sever the muscles, slice the tendons, and cleanly dismember its limbs, legs, hooves, and head. Louis Voisin was hardly what you would call a heartthrob or a hunk. Being a recent stranger in a foreign land, he was barely literate in English, with hardly enough conversation to get by, and his spelling was atrocious. And yet, there was something about him which women adored. As a native French speaker, Louis was articulate, erudite and cultured. As a patient man, he would sit, wait and listen. And as an avid reader, he would woo these lovesick women with poetry. He wasn't wealthy, educated or handsome, but he gave them what they wanted. Time, warmth and attention. And in stark contrast to his job, he was big yet gentle, powerful yet sensitive, a killer yet kind. But like all love rats, his downside was that as much as he professed his undying love for a woman, he was never faithful. In April 1916, he met his next lover, and her name was Emmeline Gevard. Born in the French city of Rouen, Emmeline Gevard was a 32-year-old housewife who was shy, quiet, and softly spoken. With pale luminescent skin, accentuated by her dark neck-length hair, baby blue eyes as wide as a startled deer's, and rosebud lips stuck somewhere between desperation and deeply tragic. Being so weak and slightly built, it looked as if a stiff breeze would blow her over. With her father in France, she had no close family. Except for her cats, she lived alone. Being so timid, her only friend was a young girl called Marguerite de Four. And with World War I raging, being enlisted in the army, Paul Gerard, her husband of seven years, had been gone for almost three. Living in a two-roomed lodging at 50 Munster Square, three streets north of Charlotte Street, although Marguerite kept her company, Emmeline hated the dark, the silence and the solitude. As even in a big city like London, miles away from the bloody battleground of the Somme, at night, German zeppelins crept across the pitch-black sky like silent clouds of death, raining down fire on the sleeping people below. Emmeline was a lonely, fragile lady who was desperate for love and protection. In April 1916, Emmeline took a job as a cook at The Commercial, an Italian restaurant at 99 Charlotte Street. With modest savings squirreled away, she didn't need the money. But being so lonely, she needed to stay busy and have someone to talk to. As the job was too hot, fast and heavy for such a frail lady, Emmeline lasted just two weeks. But by then, a new friendship had blossomed. Supplying the restaurant with fresh meat, Louis and Emmeline became an unlikely pairing. He was big and gregarious, she was tiny and meek. Her hands were neat and petite, his were large, rough and caked in blood. But as friends, they were inseparable. 
Two weeks later, Louis offered her a more suitable role as his housekeeper in his humble two-roomed lodging opposite the restaurant at 101 Charlotte Street. And during that time, their relationship went from friends to soulmates to secret lovers. And yet, 18 months later, on the 31st of October 1917, in the basement of 101 Charlotte Street, Louis Voisin would hack her lifeless body to bits. Being considerate of her needs, Louis kept their liaison quiet, with many believing they were just friends. But over Christmas 1916, their tawdry affair was tested to its fullest, when her husband Paul got 11 days leave and returned home. Sat in their two-roomed lodging at 50 Munster Square, over a home-cooked meal and a game of cards, Paul found Louis to be charming, his wife to be happier, and knowing he was unable to provide her with the companionship she needed, in early January 1917, Paul Gerard left for the French front line, reassured that Louis, his wife's new best friend, was just that. Only he wasn't. As Paul set sail on the boat train back to the trenches, Emmeline hung a large portrait of Louis above her mantelpiece, and being besotted by her lover, she continued to lavish him with meals, gifts, and even a rather substantial loan of £50, almost £3,500 today. Unaware that the money was not being used to better himself, but to support his other women. In May 1917, Emmeline left on a three-month trip to France, leaving her faithful lover a key to the house to open her post, feed her cats, and pay her rent. With Emmeline gone for three long months, Louis found himself another housekeeper and mistress. Born in the coastal city of Boulogne-sur-Mer, as a recent widow whose husband had been cruelly cut down by cannon fire at the Somme, 38-year-old Bertha Roche was weak, fragile, and tragic. And as an emotionally wrought woman, terrified of the dark, the silence, and the solitude, although they seemed like sisters, the love rat kept both of his women apart. At the end of September 1917, as Emmeline returned to London, Bertha moved into Louis' basement lodging at 101 Charlotte Street. Living in two pitifully cramped rooms, although it was adequate for a single butcher, it hardly cut a romantic tone for a loverette, his girlfriend, or his mistress. The dark sitting room was sparsely furnished with two wooden chairs, a small fire, and a coarse horsehair bed. The filthy kitchen was littered with the tools of his trade, knives, ropes, axes, and sacks. And in the backyard was the slaughterman's stables, a sad soulless shed full of two old nags on their last legs, a horse cart used for carrying larger carcasses, an overpowering stench of manure, and a thick oak table with a drain underneath to wash away the animal's guts, gizzards, and entrails. So being too afraid to walk the bomb-damaged streets alone, Bertha stayed at home. With his place being a pit, Louis preferred to wine and dine Emmeline in the modest comfort of her own home. And so, with his girlfriend and mistress just three streets apart, they remained unaware of each other, living in blissful ignorance. But one month later, Louis's love would be sorely tested. Wednesday the 31st of October 1917 was Emmeline Gerard's last day alive. As a creature of habit, every day Louis awoke at 4.30am, arrived at Smithfield Market one hour later, fed the company's horses, returned to Charlotte Street, and sat upon his horse and cart. He delivered sacks of meat and sausage parcels across Soho and Fitzrovia throughout the day. 
At 3 p.m., Louis met Emmeline. He later stated, I last saw Madame Gerard between 2 and 3 p.m. on Wednesday the 31st with a young French girl named Marguerite Dufour, who I am told intended to go to Marseille. Madame Gerard was to accompany her as far as Southampton. In her absence, she asked me to visit her home to feed her cat. Shortly afterwards, he went straight to 24 Charlotte Street. As confirmed by the occupants, Mr. and Mrs. Melanie, he returned home and attended to his horses, as witnessed by several tenants at 101 Charlotte Street. He had dinner at 7 p.m. and went to bed by 9 p.m., as witnessed by Bertha. But the night would be short. At a little before midnight, Bertha awoke with a jolt, as the fast rapid fists of their landlady, Angeline Lupins, pounded door after door, screaming, Wake up! Air raid! Bertha's bedroom was pitch black, and silent except for Louis's deep nasal snore. But beyond the hubbub of terrified tenants, whose feet thundered downstairs, through the clawing wail of sirens, the distant bangs as bombs crept ever closer, and the low drone as Zeppelin airships loomed overhead, Bertha knew that death was approaching. Dashing into the unlit passageway, Bertha stood with the other tenants, the gas lights off, the walls shaking, families holding each other tight, as above them stalked the silent killers in the clouds. Alone and petrified, as Bertha's hands shook, she called to Louis, Louis! Louis! And although the big man grunted a grumpy, All right! All right! Having survived several bombings before, seconds later, his snoring returned. Outside, although a soupy fog hung low, making visibility close to zero, it was pockmarked with yellow flashes and orange flames as the city burned. Fearing for their lives, the tenants fled their flats and braved the blacked-out streets as they raced deep into the safety of the underground platforms of Goode Street tube station. Everyone left, except Bertha and Louis. For three hours, the city shook, until suddenly, the guns stopped and the all-clear was sounded. When the tenants returned, Angeline saw that Bertha was a mess. Her hands shook, her nerves were shredded, and her pale face was etched with a haunted expression. And yet through it all, Louis slept. The next morning was a normal day for Louis. Up at 4.30, Smithfield by 5.30, home by 7.30, and he went about his deliveries on his horse and cart. Still traumatised by the night's horrors, Bertha distracted herself by scrubbing his bloodied butcher's overalls. A job Louis always preferred was handled by professionals at his local laundry. So being so heavily soiled, and with Bertha's nerves too shot, she left his white and blue striped shirt to soak. And with a fierce storm brewing, as a bitter wind whipped up, being too strong for the zeppelins to fly, the next night was silent, as Bertha slept and Louis snored. On Friday the 2nd of November 1917, as the shell-shocked citizens counted the cost of lost homes and lost lives in their bomb-cratered city, one mile northeast of Charlotte Street, Thomas Henry, a nurse at the local insane asylum, left his home at 17 Regent Square. By then, the lashing rain had stopped. Being a large private garden, with lines of four-storey terraced houses on all sides, as Thomas strolled along the south side towards the central gate, he spotted two large parcels, half hidden in the bushes. With the larger parcel, as big as a 50 kilo sack of spuds, and the other slightly smaller, 
neatly wrapped in coarse muslin sacks and tied with thick twine. They looked too tidy to be trash. So feeling curious, Thomas pried the larger parcel open. And what he found was undeniably human flesh. Examined by Divisional Surgeon John Cabe, underneath the brown sacks and bound in rib strips of red bedsheets, the large parcel contained a woman's torso, naked but for a silk chemise and a cotton vest, her wrists, knees and necks severed, leaving their ends little more than fleshy stumps. The remains of her lower legs in the smaller sack, but her hands and head were missing. Who she was, they didn't know. She had no papers, no birthmark, and matched no missing person. But a few things were certain. With the ground sodden, but the parcel damp, as the rain had ceased by 4am, her body had been dumped shortly after that. With bruises on her thighs, arms and shins, her death was preceded by a violent struggle. And with her pallid skin slipping off her bloated body and flies feeding on her festering blood, as they lay maggots in her rotting flesh, judging by the corpse's decay, she had been dead for at least 30 hours, putting her time of death as during the air raid. But for Dr. Cabe, her method of death was truly perplexing, as this was not the work of a crazed maniac absorbed in the killing frenzy. This was someone with patience. Her hands, legs and head had been severed with a swift single strike, using a sharp instrument, possibly an axe, wielded by a powerful man with a great deal of skill and a solid knowledge of anatomy. And yet, with small blood spots on her heart indicating she had died of asphyxia, with all of her internal organs being healthy but pale. Before she died, she had bled, losing almost two pints of blood. Which begged the question, why were her cuts so clean and efficient, and yet her death was painful and slow? To answer that, they needed to know who she was. On a scrap of brown paper, stitched to her chemise, the killer had crudely scrawled the words Bloody Belgian. Only with the spelling being so atrocious, it actually read Bloody Belgium. With the war at its peak, hostilities high, and everyone seen as either an ally or an enemy, was this a political attack? Thankfully, sewn into the lining of the red bedsheets was a laundry mark. It simply read 11H. Last seen on the night of the air raid, police entered her home at 50 Munster Square, accompanied by noted pathologist Bernard Spilsbury. The door was locked, the rooms were in disarray, and the drawers had been ransacked. With a splash of blood on the bedhead, a small red puddle in the middle, and its bedsheet missing. Having spotted an identical selection of red bedsheets stitched with the laundry mark 11H, a connection had been made between the bed and the body. With ragged shreds of coarse muslin sacking in the cupboard, strands of thick twine on the floor, a flick of blood spots on two doors, a half-full pail of pinkish water, and sticky red stains splashed across the table. With the blood being confirmed as human, it looked as if this was where the murder and the dismemberment had occurred but the evidence didn't sit well with Bernard Spilsbury. Something just wasn't right. If this was a burglary, how did they get in if they didn't break in? If this was a dismemberment, where were the knives and axes? If this was a political attack on a bloody Belgian, why had they targeted a shy, quiet, introverted French lady with no political beliefs or leanings. And if this was a murder, where was the blood? 
having been decapitated within an hour of her death, with her arms, legs and head severed. Although a small pail of pinkish water suggested that a half-hearted cleanup had taken place, as her arteries ripped and her veins split during this violent struggle, walls would be splashed, doors splattered, and the bed drenched. As squelching underfoot, the carpet would be a thick slick of sticky red ooze, swarming with feverish flies. But it wasn't. If anything, it looked as if the two rooms at 50 Munster Square had been staged. With her husband at war, her father in France, Marguerite in Marseille, and no other family close by, police contacted her only known friend, whose love letters were found in her drawer, an IOU for £50 signed by him on the table, and whose portrait proudly hung over the mantelpiece. And as a powerfully built French butcher, who lived just three streets south, Louis Voisin was a very credible suspect. Although he spoke very little English, Chief Inspector Wensley interviewed Louis Voisin. He was polite, helpful and calm. With an alibi for the 36 hours around Emmeline's death, he stated, I last saw Madame Gerard between 2 and 3 p.m. on Wednesday the 31st with a young French girl named Marguerite Dufour, who I am told intended to go to Marseille. Madame Gerard was to accompany her as far as Southampton. In her absence, she asked me to visit her home to feed her cat. All of which was verified by his friends, family, lodgers, colleagues, and his girlfriend, Bertha Roche. He loved Emmeline, he missed Emmeline, and even though the portly love rat juggled a romance with two women who he kept apart, it was clear that he adored them both and would hurt neither. Only his story had holes. On Friday the 2nd of November 1917, aided by his English-speaking nephew, Leon Duvar, Louis Voisin told Emmeline's landlady, Mary Rouse, that she had gone to France for two weeks. Except, on the night of the Zeppelin air raid, Mary heard her in her flat. She was nervously pacing, and at a little after 11.30pm, as the air raid sirens wailed, Emmeline left 50 Munster Square alone and was carrying no luggage. With Bertha unable to recall if the bloody overall she washed was due to a bullock he slaughtered in Whitechapel or a calf he cut up in Surbiton, on a hunch, Chief Inspector Wensley asked Louis to write these two words. Bloody Belgian. The handwriting was a match, and his spelling was atrocious, having mistakenly written Bloody Belgium. When Dr. Spilsbury stood on the fly-infested sticky stone floor of the dark and gloomy basement of 101 Charlotte Street, the pathologist knew that this was the scene of Emmeline's murder and dismemberment. With a broken glass panel on the door between the kitchen and the yard, its wood speckled with fine spots, specks inside the hinge, and blood splattered a two-foot radius spraying up the sink, the gas stove, and even the ceiling. He knew the attack had taken place by the open door. Seeing a bloody towel hanging up, inside were found strands of long brown hair and a pearl earring caught on the towel which had been used to muffle her screams. With a bloody trail from the door to the stables, having dragged her body, her disposal was shielded by the blackout, low fog, and the cacophony of bombs, guns, and sirens. Surrounded by knives, saws, and axes, on a thick oak table, he had hacked Emmeline to bits. And with her torso and limbs wrapped in muslin sacks, no one would suspect a butcher on his horse and cart as he travelled from Charlotte Street to Smithfield Market, stopping off halfway 
at Regent Square, where the body parts were found. Inside, they found his blood-soaked shirt, which a terrified Bertha had tried to wash. Hidden inside a secret panel by the mantelpiece was a stash of Emmeline's jewellery, and in a large barrel, peeping through a thick layer of sawdust, her mouth open, her eyes wide, and her neck a bloody stump. Police found the head of Emmeline Gerard. On the 15th of January 1918, at the Old Bailey, they both stood trial. Louis described as a powerful, imposing brute, Bertha as weak, pale, and pathetic. When asked how he pleaded, Louis stated, Not guilty. When asked how she pleaded, Louis slammed his fists onto the table and growled, Madame Roche is innocent. She is pure as the driven snow. Stating, Her only crime is her selfless love for me. Only the police knew better. One question had plagued the investigation into Emmeline's death. Why were her cuts so clean and efficient? And yet her death was painful and slow. Louis Voisin was a love rat. With a girlfriend and a mistress, carefully kept three streets apart. And although unaware of each other, both women were strikingly similar, being frail, pale and lonely. At 11.30pm, on the 31st of October 1917, with the distant bangs of bombs drawing ever closer, as Bertha shook, so did Emmeline. Terrified, she ran to Charlotte Street to seek safety in her lover's arms. Only opening his door, she found Louis in the arms of another. His women fought, his ladies screamed, and the love rat tried to break it up. But raging with jealousy, Bertha grabbed a fire poker and smashed her love rival over the head. Blooded but only dazed, as Bertha's strike was too weak, Emmeline screamed. So as Louis muffled her pained howls with a towel, Bertha feebly struck her victim six more times. Forced to make a fatal decision, Louis grabbed the poker. With a single powerful strike, he ended her life. Desperate to protect her, he dismembered the body, disposed of the bits, and created a subterfuge to throw the police off the culprit, his beloved Bertha. After a three-day trial, Louis Voisin was found guilty of murder, and Bertha Roche was found guilty as an accessory to murder, his gallantry for his girlfriend having swayed the jury. On the 2nd of March 1918, Louis Racine was executed by hanging. His girlfriend, having been spared a death sentence, she showed no pity or remorse. And having been sentenced to seven years in prison, as a nervous woman, she was driven insane and died in Liverpool Asylum one year later. Never once shedding a single tear for her victim or the love rat who saved her life. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget Murky Miler, stay tuned for more extra goodies after the break. But before that, here's my recommended podcasts of the week, which are True Crime Finland and True Crime Fix. Hi, this is Minna from True Crime Finland. Ah, Finland, so peaceful and quiet. There isn't even any crime there, right? Wrong. Join me every two weeks in discovering the dark side of the land of a thousand lakes. From legendary and infamous to the lesser known and forgotten Finnish cases, the podcast will be sure to offer something for everyone. Find True Crime Finland wherever you get your podcasts.
How many of you know the name Linda Goff or Sarah Marslin? I bet you will have heard of their murderers though, Fred West and Harold Shipman. Hi everybody, this is Steve, the host of True Crime Fix, the podcast which gives the story whilst giving the victim the loudest voice of them all. So far we've covered cases such as Coletta Ram, Kitty Genovese, Jackie Paul, JC Sawyer and Molly McLaren. I'll be releasing new episodes every other Friday via Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify and all other available stations. So please come over and subscribe and give my podcast a listen. I really hope that you find these episodes informative. If you would like further information, please follow me on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod or find me on Facebook, True Crime Fix Podcast. And remember, stay safe, look after each other and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone. A huge thank you goes out to my new Patreon supporters who are Clive Lewis, Ian Watts, Maria Dean and Stacey Kielginski who will all be treated to some seriously good goodies, many of which are only available via Patreon. Sorry, but cakes don't buy themselves, you know. A little shout out this week to a new true crime podcast. So hi to Jeru and Stanley of Bad in the Boondocks. It's a new podcast, so give it a go. And just to say, to anyone going to the London True Crime Meetup on Sunday the 7th and Monday the 8th of July, hosted by Generation Y and They Walk Among Us, I will be there. Sadly, I can't make the Manchester one, as some of us have to work early on Sundays. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with no name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Uh, ooh, yeah, that'll be a bugger turn. Way! Oh my god, that was. Oh, oh yawn time. That was. Oh, I've been stifling that yawn for ages. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Extra Mile. Oh, I'm going to have a swig of uh, water. Mm. That was needed. Cool, that was a hard one. There wasn't loads of accents in it, it was just. Oh, god. I'd written it in a very flowery way, and sometimes it's hard to get your mouth around some of those words. Anyway, everyone, welcome. Welcome to Extra Mile. For new people, I'm going to go and make a cup of tea. Uh, for new people, this is uh, Extra Mile. This is uh, the unedited bit, unscripted. Uh, it's, uh, I'll give you loads of information about this story that's not in the episode. Uh, that's going to come up very shortly. But right now I've got to make myself a cup of tea. Why do I make myself a cup of tea at the start, of the show, uh, end of the show? Because I've just finished my cup of tea whilst recording this. So now I'm off making the cup of tea. Uh, hang on. Turning up the kettle. I have lots of bottles of water dotted around. Why? Because I'm too lazy to put... Well, I'm not too lazy to put on my water pump. I'm just cautious of... If I ever get a leak, because I'm on the boat, if I get a leak sometime and I'm away, if there's a little leak and the water pump is on, it won't know when to turn off. And some people have had that, they've come home and their boats have sunk. Or have been really badly flooded just because, you know, the water pump has just been going, moo, moo, just pumping and pumping. So uh, I have my water pump off, so I fill up loads of water bottles everywhere uh, and have them around the boat so I don't need to have the water pump on. Genius idea. Just getting rid of the big sheet in front of the window. I'm gonna open some windows as well. Cool, fresh air, that was good. I'm gonna open this window as well. I always have all the windows shut so it makes it nice and soundproof so it, because you can hear the birds outside. I'm moored up in a quite a nice bit at the moment. I've been here before, but uh, it's nice and quiet. It's, it's, it's hidden away, but because it's been raining a bit. I'm doing this in a two hour window when the rain isn't raining. Uh, unfortunately, when it rains a bit and then it stops, the birds start going, ooh, ooh, ooh. And, and behind me is sheep, which is very nice. But so in the background you might hear, Meh. 
<coughs> and and we've got coots in front we've got we've got swans we've got uh white geese which are down there as well and then there's a man doing some lawn mowing in front but apart from that it's not too bad Whew. if you looked on my social media you would see the pictures of the uh, uh of the baby coots loads of baby coots and some swans with some little signets as well they were really sweet as well Anyway, so I'm in a nice place now. I had to move because I was literally moored up. Uh, I won't say where it was, but I was in a place where I normally am. And I thought, oh, this is nice. I like it here. I'll, I'll just stay here. Um, and then I heard some one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I said, like, oh, what's that? It sounds like someone's doing a sound check. So I went through, the, because there's a big park opposite. I went through the park and where the industrial area normally was, it, it looked like they were doing a festival. It was just being built. And I had a look at it and I thought, well, do you know, there's a bit of a fairground in there, so it must be fine. So uh, I went online, I found out what it was called. It's called Field Day. And I looked, did a little Wikipedia, one of the rare occasions I use Wikipedia. I went on Wikipedia and it was like, Field Day. Created in 2008, it has a, it has a village atmosphere with tombolas and stuff like that. And I thought, oh, that's all right. Yeah, that sounds really good. And then it was like, uh, in the first year, they had like Mumford and Sons. You know, they're a bit kind of folk music. And I thought, you know what, that's not too bad. I haven't got a problem with that. And I thought, it's a concert as well. It'll be finished by half past ten, which means I can do what I need to do. Anyway, I did, because I, I'm always worried about stuff. I, I went through and I went, let's look at their listings. And I had a look at the listings for this year, and it was like, DJ this. Uh, everyone's name is with DJ, their first name. Uh, something misspelt, because you've got because if you're a DJ, something has to be misspelt about your name. It has to be rough cut, spelt R-U-F-K-U-T-Z, you know. Because apparently illiteracy, illiteracy is fashionable, uh, and then and then uh, there was uh, I'd look at the listing and it said there there'll be uh, so, uh, warehouses set up. There's big warehouses there, and the music will be playing until three a.m. And I thought last thing I need is music till three a.m. Probably half, half three, and then ever all the piss heads coming down the canal path, banging on the boats. Uh, so I decided to move. I also heard them sound checking, and, and uh, five of the songs had the same beat. Literally, it was, and I was like, is it the same song? No. And then there was some R&B in there, and you know I hate R&B. And three songs in a row had, oh, baby, oh, and I was just like, oh, dear God. So uh, so I moved I moved about a mile north, and now it's, it's nice and peaceful here, so it's good. So I'm just doing the recording up nice and early, going to do some recording, going to go into town. <sighs> check my post i know i check my post like once a month now uh and then uh i'm uh, gonna do some editing editing yes and then uh, murder mile tomorrow right uh ankle update as you know i sprained my ankle about two weeks ago uh it was huge i fell off a, a, a lock i didn't really fall off it i kind of tripped and landed my ankle was about 90 degrees the wrong or 45 degrees the wrong way uh, and then I, I thought, oh, it's fine, it's fine. But then uh, as I started, I did a couple more locks and then I looked down, it was about twice the size. And then uh, I rested it and then my foot was like twice the size it should have been. It was huge. Uh, but I iced it, I rested it, I cancelled the murder mile. Uh, got it fit and well. Because obviously uh, the, the guys from uh, uh, North Idaho College, sorry guys, last week I said University of Idaho. You, uh, Molly and Aaron and the gang of North Idaho College. Sorry, I raced back to record that for you and I got it wrong. Uh, I, I wanted to make sure I was fit and well for them. So I rested up and I cancelled the murder mile and then I rested up for them. So my feet are all good now. And now I'm here and next week I'm getting my new covers on the boat, which is very exciting. So uh, it's all going very well. It's all going very well. Tease up. Right. Got to have a cuppa. What is life without a cuppa? What is life without a cuppa in a murder mile mug? Just saying that I've got loads of loads of murder mile mugs in. Murder mile mugs. Uh, I've read it because because the murder mile mugs are no longer uh, the ones with the the sweets, the horrible sweets that seem to melt everywhere and cause everyone problems. I took the sweets out, and with the sweets in, that would be uh, uh, just over half a kilo, right? But with the sweets out. It was under half a kilo. So I, I then found out they actually made sending murder mile mugs overseas or, or, or Britain a lot cheaper, like overseas, like to America, Canada, places like that, Australia. It makes it about two pounds cheaper. 
So I've taken the sweets out. The sweets, like the sweets, were worth weren't worth much anyway. And it, but the but in terms of weight, it made the package more. Uh, um, uh, I can't speak heavier. So when you order a mod, mobile mug now, um, uh, it's not as much to send. Do you, I think I think to America it's only like it's it's like nine pounds now. So that's not bad because before it was about eleven fifty. I think. <laughs> Which is a bit pricey, especially as, as the mugs are only worth about ten of them. So uh, yeah, there we go. Anyway, let's dive into this story. Hope you enjoyed that. That was a uh, Louis Voisin, uh, the French butcher. I quite enjoyed that story because uh, I deliberately played with it a little bit. But the idea is, you know, um, he he's quite clearly. You look at him and you think, oh, he's got to be the murderer. Look at him. He's big. He's huge. He knows how to use an axe. He's got a. Dip- a place in his back garden where he can get rid of bodies you know he's got he can drive his car across london and you know it's got it'll have meat in it and no one will suspect him and uh but actually he really wasn't the murderer it was his it was his very jealous girlfriend Ooh, plot twist anyway let's dive into some details tea slurp i did a slight slurp because i know people don't like the sound of uh <coughs> tea being slurped right um in a, in a lot of these stories especially if you look online it will say that the body was found by someone called jack the sweeper right that's bollocks that was bollocks created by the press to make it sound more exciting because obviously this this is kind of uh late 1910s so it's, it's still only about 30 years after jack the ripper but obviously every time there's a kind of a grisly body bleh, all the press kind of jump on the old jack the ripper thing which they still do today the same tabloid bullshit so as you know as mentioned in here uh the body parts were actually found by thomas george henry who was a male l- nurse at the local lunatic asylum haven't found out which one that was yet and he lived on regent square that's the truth not what it says on shite like wikipedia where it says he was found dragged by the jack the sweeper that is bullshit right uh there were a couple of things in there that i i left out slightly only because it kind of um it was hard to explain his back and forth so i deliberately left this out so uh louis voisin gave a couple of statements uh, one of which was partially true, one of which wasn't true at all. He, uh, he, all the time he was trying to protect his girlfriend. So he said that uh, on the 1st of November, the day after the murder, he left home about 10 a.m., arrived at his bullshit, arrived at Smithfield Market about 10.30, bought half a calf head and feet and bought it home at about midday. This is important because later on he says that the blood in his kitchen uh, was from cutting up animals, even though the blood that was found was actually human. On Saturday the third, so this is two days later. This is this is d- two days after the body was found, but before uh, the search of his flat. He said on that day um, he went to Smithfield Market as I did the day before and returned home about seven thirty a.m. Had breakfast, harnessed the horses, and drove a horse, my horse and trap, to Fifty Munster Square, that's Emmeline's house, in order to get the letters. He said he would read the post when EG, uh, I've written EG here for myself, Emmeline Gerard was away at her request. I came home, got a knife, a sharpener and a saw from the passage of his home. Uh, I then went with my horses and tools to Mr Lorne's shop in Charing Cross Road. Uh, that's his boss, he's a pork butchers. There I received a, a, tele, a telephonic message uh, to go to Regent Farm in Surbiton, that's Mr. Lorne's personal farm, to cut up a bullock for him. This is where the story starts diverting, because this is the uh, the blood on his personal overalls that his girlfriend, Bertha, was washing. This is the bullock on the third. She says he cut up a calf on the first, and that's why his uh, overalls were covered in blood because it was it was a bit of a cock up. He he didn't kill it cleanly, and there was a lot of blood, and that's why why they're saying the, where the blood came from. Uh, he arrived at ten thirty p.m., cut up a bullock, and returned at six p.m. I am a butcher by trade, and last Saturday, uh, for the first time, I cut up a beast for at least twelve months past. See, uh, that can't be right because his girlfriend says that he cut up a calf in Whitechapel. Uh, where's the bit that I wanted to go to? I'm just going through. I, I put down a load when I was because I knew there's loads I was going to take out. There's loads that I knew I was going to take out. Right. Okay. This is interesting. So I mentioned Mary Elizabeth Rouse. Uh, she lived at 48 Munster Square. She owned 50 Munster Square, which was Emmeline's property. Uh, 
on the 2nd of November, so this is two days after the murders, she saw Louis Voisin arrive on a cart with a little boy, his nephew. I've just I mentioned him slightly. That was uh, Leon Duvois. Uh, she spoke to him. Leon, his little nephew, uh, spoke good English. Louis doesn't speak English, so he, uh, Louis, that's why the little boy was there to translate for him. Uh, uh, he said that uh, Emmeline Gerard had gone away to France for a fortnight and that there would be a sack of potatoes coming for her. Um, it would arrive at uh, Mary's house. Could she pay for it? And she agreed to it. Blah, 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 blah. Sack of potatoes. Right. Uh, uh, nephew uh, Leon Duvois, who was the son of Blanche, which is uh, uh, Bertha's twin sister. I didn't bring in the twin sister in that because I just knew that that's what, that was, this was... Conf, conf, <gasps> can't speak. Uh, confuse things. Uh, Leon and Blanche... Uh, went to 101 Charlotte Street for dinner that very evening. Uh, uh, why have I put that there? Yes, and then it was mentioned there again that uh, Emmeline was going away to the country for two weeks and that a sack of potatoes would be arriving for it and that's when he asked uh, Leon to help him uh, uh, translate this. Hang on, where's the important bit that I was looking for? Oh yeah, so uh, when they went to... Uh, when Leon... And uh, what's his name? Louis. Leon Louis. Interesting. Uh, when they went to 50 Munster Square, which is Emmeline's house, uh, Louis went in there, uh, collected a couple of things, and then he left. And then all of a sudden he, he went, oh, oh, I forgot when he was about a street, a street away. He went, oh, I've forgotten something. And he ran back to the house, left Leon on the cart. And then Leon said he ran back, uh, Louis ran back to the cart and he was holding something under his arm. It seemed to be like a small rug. Uh, it was rolled up and tied with a piece of string, a, a piece of the thick twine that was used in the story. Uh, he didn't know what the rug was, but he never saw it again. So that was interesting. Whether that was uh, some of the... Because obviously um, Louis had gone in there into 50 Munster Square to make it look like a crime scene. So it is believed that he took some of the body parts there to um, uh, 50 Munster Square, uh, placed them around, made it uh, made them bleed a bit, of, you know, splattered some blood everywhere, made the blood leak in different places, stuff like that. And this was him returning some of the body parts back. back. But actually, what was there, we actually don't know. Um, Louis gave a fuller confession... Uh, this one was quite interesting. I was going to put it in, but I thought it was just it would just really complicate the story. So on T slurp on the sixth of November, uh, this was after he was arrested. He given a confession first when he said, "I don't know anything about it." And when when they arrested uh, Bertha, his girlfriend, obviously he became quite defensive about this. Uh, so this became his confession. He said, "Madame Martin." She, he calls her Madame Martin because her husband. Uh, I think he was called Edward Martin, something like that. Yeah. So because she was a widow, um, out of respect for her, he refers to her as Madame Martin, uh, even though Madame Martin is Bertha Gerard. Uh, so uh, Madame Martin is not. This is what he said. Madame Martin is not concerned in this crime at all. The crime was committed at Madame. <coughs> uh, sorry, I just confused you then by calling her. Uh, um, Madame Martin, I just said she was Madame Gerard. She's not. Oh, this is confusing, right? Madame Martin is Bertha Roche. Yeah. Uh, Madame Gerard is Emmeline Gerard. Right. Madame Martin. Now, that is Bertha Roche. I wish he wouldn't do that. I'm going to call her Bertha Roche from now on. Right. Sod him. Uh, Bertha Gerard is not concerned in this crime at all. The crime was committed at Emmeline Gerard's place. It was. It was 50 Monster Square last Thursday, which was the 1st of November at 11am. Uh, and when I arrived, the door was closed, but not locked. Uh, this is when he says he discovered that she was dead, which is all bullshit. Uh, the floor and the carpet was full of blood. The head and hands were wrapped in a flannel jacket, which is at my place now. He's trying to give him a reason why. Um, his flannel jacket, which was being washed by Bertha and his shirt, was covered in blood. Uh, they were on the kitchen table. That is all I could see. The rest of the body was not there. I was so astonished at such an affair. I didn't know what to do. I remained there for five minutes stupefied. I thought that a trap had been paid for me. 
I commence to clean up the body, which explains the pail of water and the kind of pinkish uh, water, and my clothes became stained with it. Uh, I left the head and the hands wrapped up. I put the lot in a carpet, a small rug by the side of the bed. The chamber pot was full of blood, and the outside was also covered. The pail was full of blood and water. There was blood-stained finger marks on the handle of the jug. Then I went back to my house, had lunch, as you do, you know, you've just seen someone murdered, you go back, you have some lunch. Uh, and then later returned to Madame Gerard's place and took the packet to my place. What is that packet? We don't know. Uh, I kept thinking this was a trap. Annoying man going past on his bike. Uh, I had no intention to do any harm to Madame Gerard. Why should I kill her? I didn't want anything. Uh, Madame Gerard owes me nothing, and I owe her, her nothing, which is not true, actually. Um, if you notice, there was uh, a mention in there about a £50 IOU. Uh, he did pay some of it back, but he didn't pay all of it back, and actually uh, the period for that had expired. Uh, I didn't focus on that in the story because I didn't want you to think that this was a story about money. It's not a story about money, it's about love, so I deliberately held back on that a little bit. Uh, I want. Uh, he also said, I, I wanted to see... Uh, Hang on. Uh, uh, he mentioned in here as well that uh, he said that Madame Gerard was mixing with bad associates and had, t had taken people to her flat. I know that she had taken someone there that night and, and there are letters there to show that she had been meeting men. Uh, he tried to insinuate that other people were involved and that someone else might have murdered her, another lover. Um, the police went through her letters. They found a stack of letters. There was loads of letters between her and her husband. There was like one or two with maybe one or two other men, but it, there was nothing really sordid about it. It was kind of just, you know, just kind of friendliness, really. Um, uh, what else have we got? Uh, in the morning from half past 10 to 11 o'clock, I went back to 50 Munster Square and returned to my place. I brought back Madame Gerard's jewels, her silver bag, her rings, Mr. Gerard's ring, all of her jewels I have enclosed in the same box. Uh, he also had two post office books. Um, this was, I mentioned in there that he, uh, she, he had some of her uh, jewellery. Uh, police found it in a, a kind of a secret compartment and he, he, he later said, oh, well, do you know, I was just looking after it for, uh, do you know, because... Uh, um, in case in case someone broke in all bollocks um he also said uh, if there were any blood stop uh, blood if there were any spots of blood in my kitchen it is because every week i bought a calf's head and feet and sheep's feet some hairs and in cleaning these it is inevitable that spots of blood were found on the floor and on the walls of my kitchen i am innocent i'm i if i am guilty of anything oh burp that would be of having brought these objects so unfortunate to my house but i could not but i could not destroy them um uh i took this out of the story because it throws it off uh in her house they found a gladstone bag it's kind of uh, uh an early precursor to a kind of a, a, a kind of carry-on suitcase uh, it was marked with his, his initials LV and he'd loaned her a bag because she was thinking about going away but she hadn't um, this would have been the bag that she probably would have used to take her stuff in she, if she was going to Marseille with uh, Marguerite de Four, but she didn't this was in the house I left that out because I just thought it just throws everything off but it was marked with his initials Ooh, why do people do that if you're going to murder someone don't have anything with your initials on it such an idiot um, <laughs> uh, disposal this is an interesting point um, I mentioned this in the story, but immediately between Charlotte Street and Smithfield Market, right in the middle, the most direct route is Regent Square. So, uh, as we said, the rain had stopped at 4 a.m. The body was the body parts were found at 8:30 a.m. He woke up at four. He's normally at Smithfield Market by about 5:30. Uh, that would that would mean that he would have dropped off the body parts at about 5 a.m. in Regent Square, which is directly on route for him. Why he decided to drop them off, we don't know. This is kind of a weird thing, isn't it? Is it? He's a butcher. So 
there'll be loads of meat so it would and uh he makes sausages as well like sausages n- not the purest of uh do you know it's not like veal cutlets is it it's sausages it's like it's a mix of meat and there's a lot of fat in there there's gristle as well uh as we've already had in britain a couple of years ago the whole horse meat scandal where everyone was there for ages eating all of these like burgers and things going oh these are delicious pork or beef burgers and then uh they were like, oh, actually, there's a lot of horse meat in it. Uh, we're sorry about that. And it's like, oh, people ready to vomit. Uh, so why didn't he just do that? Why didn't he just, because he was a butcher, why didn't he just cut her up? I mean, he'd already chopped her into bits anyway. Why not? Why not fillet her, chop off her, her meat, and then put it into a grinder? She'd never be seen ever again. The, the bones he could throw out with all the other animal bones. You know, smash them up. She could have been entirely disposed of. So why did why did he make the decision to dump her body parts in public? Doesn't make sense. It's a bit it's a bit stupid to be honest. Uh, all the things that he found. So uh, in her in the bed in his bed sitting room, uh, uh, there was a very high mantelpiece which was draped in deep curtains. Uh, under the curtain, the police found two concealed panels which were behind a carriage clock. Uh, and in there they found uh, Madame Gerard's jewellery, which included a lady's gold watch, a gold neck chain with a small cross, a gold ring with a small diamond. See, she was, she had, uh, even though she was working as a uh, uh, a cook, that really is what the reason why I said she didn't need the money. Because when you look at what she has, you know, she she had a lot, she had money in the bank, which I'll mention very shortly as well, and she had a lot of good possessions as well. Uh, a plain gold wedding ring, a small diamond and sapphire ring, a lady's gold ring set with small diamonds, a lady's silver chain bag, uh, in an envelope which was uh, held by Bertha. They found a small mother of pearl pendant, uh, a post office savings book issued to Emmeline Gerard. Uh, the balance of that was ninety pounds, so that's about five and a half thousand pounds today. They also found a post office savings book in the name of Paul Gerard, which was a hundred and one thousand pounds. So that's like six. What's that? About six thousand uh, pounds. Second autopsy. Normally, I go into the full details of the autopsy here for you, but this slurp. This story um, is longer than I expected it to be. I always try and get these episodes down to like a, you know, about half an hour, 40 minutes maximum. Uh, I don't like them to be too long. Um, <clears throat> so normally I go into all the uh, autopsy details, but I didn't hear. I did it. There were the first autopsy when they found the um, body parts, the torso and the legs. Uh, but with the hands and head missing, they had to do a second autopsy. So this was on Tuesday the 6th of November. Uh, hang on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tuesday the 6th of November. So they found the body parts uh, in uh, 101 Charlotte Street. They examined the head and the hands. It's partially covered covered in a white powder and taken for analysis. Um, an earring was found which matched the one on the towel. So uh, we mentioned about the little earring that was uh, removed uh, in the struggle. Uh, one was found in the other ear. Uh, bruises on both hands, which are defensive wounds. The head had a large amount of bruising on the left forehead, around the left eye, the upper part of the left cheek, uh, with abrasions to her left ear, nose, right eye, right cheek. cheek bo- her cheekbone was fractured. Her right eye orbit was fractured. There was a deep wound to the back of the head, which was about one and a half inches long. Another on the top of the head, which was three and a half inches long. Um, this wound was gaping open, two and a half inches wide. Ooh. Um, bones exposed at the base of the wound. A third gaping wound, uh, one and a half inches wide in the front. A fourth wound at the back of the head. Uh, but they said the brain was not injured. Um... Four wounds to the head and four wounds to the face. So eight in total. Uh, obviously, the uh, the big wound at the top, uh, the big old bugger that we just mentioned on the top of the head, three and a half inches long. Obviously, that would be um, that would be Louis's one because uh, <coughs> it was the one that really did just killed her outright. Um, she would not remain standing uh, when the rest of the injuries were inflicted. Uh, the later injuries to the head would have been caused by significant splashing of the later injuries to the head would have caused caused significant splashings of blood 
uh, for some distance uh, onto surrounding objects. She had survived her injuries for at least two minutes. Uh, she would have, she would probably have been unconscious and have bled to death. Uh, oddly, the head, uh, oddly to the head, several wounds to the back were caused by repeated blows by a blunt object inflicted when she was alive. Um, this is what Sir Bernard Spilsbury says. Uh, sorry, Bernard Spilsbury. He would. Sorry, I I had to correct it in this because. Um, uh, normally I say Sir Bernard Spilsbury, but I, I double-checked. He wasn't knighted until 1923. Uh, so this is uh, four years later. So I had to backtrack on this. And then, because he's because he's not a doctor either, I had to keep changing it in here. So that's why I call him Bernard Spilsbury instead of Sir Bernard Spilsbury. So that's why. Uh, this was his words. Um, so uh, repeated blows to the head caused by a blunt instrument inflicted when she was alive. Uh it was not as heavy and fast uh, as the dismemberment. The death was due to shock and hemorrhage due to injuries to the head. The instrument was not heavy, but was used with some considerable force. So this is where they, they were kind of looking at it and going, hang on, this doesn't make sense. There was like one big blow to the head, but there were like lots of little blows which were, which just didn't, didn't tally up. Uh, trial, okay. Uh, trial on the fifteenth of January, nineteen eighteen, at the Old Bailey. They both stood trial. Uh, <coughs> he stepped briskly into the dock. Uh, Bertha Roche was very pale and showed signs of much weakness. Uh, <laughs> uh, where are we going with this? Da, 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 da. What was interesting? Uh, at the trial, it was clear that a powerful brute like Voisin, with the tools of his trade in his hand, could have felled his mistress with one blow. And he never stopped repeating that Bertha Blow, Bertha Roche, was as pure and innocent as the driven snow. Her only crime was her selfless love for him. Uh, anything more interesting here? Uh, still trying to find out more about her Bertha Roche uh, was later tried and found guilty of being an accessory to murder after the fact uh, she was sentenced to seven years in prison, imprisonment however she went mad in prison and was committed to hospital for, to a hospital for the insane in Liverpool where she died on the 22nd of March 1919 so that was that was practically a year later she survived um, I think that's it I think that's all the information, really. So uh, that's good. How long have we done? Whoa! I don't want to make this episode too long. Because this edit is going to be a bugger. It really is. Right. Listeners' questions. Da, 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 da. Uh, one listener posted uh, a question. So I said that I'll put it in extra mile. Uh, and then other listeners, I said, if anybody else has got any questions, uh, put those in as well. So other listeners did. So that, that, that's one of the reasons why it's good to join the Murder Mile discussion group on Facebook. Uh, I have my I have my regular murder. It's called Murder Mile Walks and True Crime Podcast. That's the Facebook group. That's the one I use for my walks and kind of information. But if you want to have a chat about all things Murder Mile related and pose me any questions, go to the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast discussion group. Um uh there's a nice group of people in there it's it's not one of these forums where people share a lot of crap you know there's, there's quite a few forums out there where you think to yourself is this really a true crime forum and, and it's just like people sharing pictures of their dinner and you know saying oh it's just oh do you know it's fine people can do that but i i i i, I as someone who goes to forums i i prefer to have one where it was just about murder while it's very it's it's not strict but it's like if you post something that's not murder mile related i'll just delete it but you can post me anything about Murderwell and I'll answer it. Or you can post other people questions as well. So it's it's nice. It's a really nice community. Everyone's very supportive. Everyone's very welcoming. There's no issues in here at all. We, we've never had a, a, a single person who's a problem so uh please do join us it's the murder mile discussion group on facebook so listener questions uh first question from simon lewis uh this is in reference to the original gordon west episode the the one uh i think two or three episodes back i'm losing track now because i'm i'm a couple of episodes ahead of you uh this is the one with the guy who was uh went into the toilet to have a pp and and there's a clip joint and the guy set fire to it and he burnt to death in the toilet lovely so this is in reference to clip joints. Uh, Simon's question was, my question is, would you consider a terms and conditions on the start of each podcast, i.e. just like at, at a clip joint? Something like, by listening to this podcast, you agreed to send Michael Buchanan Dunn, that's me, £100. 
So I'm going to think that's a fantastic idea. I think we'll do that from now on. So uh, 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 I'm going to put it in here um, really fast. Uh, this is a small bit you need to send Michael to 100 pounds. Terms and conditions apply. There, I've just put it in there. So by hearing those terms and conditions, you all owe me 100 pounds. Simon, I'll give you 10 pounds for each of those. Uh, so there we go. Uh, please send your 100 pounds immediately. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Anastasia Finnegan uh, asked the question, I am always curious about what cases you won't cover, uh, excluding the ones for lack of information, of course. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, some, sometimes some of the cases are just dull. I think that's the problem is, is I, there's been some cases where I've sat down. There's one that I'm still battling with at the moment. Uh, and it's not really a lack of information. It's just, I just don't care. I think for me, that's, that's the key thing is, is that I have to go through the cases and I have to go through, uh, uh, what people's lives are about. And it's a, for me, it's about finding out that nugget, that little piece of information that just makes me interested. So it's not about how how did the killer kill the other person? What injuries did they have? It's like, do you know, what's going on in their life? Uh, wh where's the sadness? Like like with uh, the, the Charlie Chirgwin episode. Do you know, I thought that was really nice because what is it about it's it's not about it's not about bureaucracy it's not about an evil man it's it's just about a woman trying to get a bed for her, her babies that's what i like it's things like that so uh, uh so the only time i really won't do an episode is if i can't find anything in it interestingly so next week's episode the one i'm working on now is one that i've been trying to do for ages and ages and ages and i was like i was like oh it's such a big case i'm desperate to cover it but there's n there's no there's no in you know you can do a big case but the problem is it can be big but there can be nothing emotional to draw you in there's nothing great in there and i almost gave up on it i just thought it's it's too big and i'm just even though there's loads of people dead and it's really horrific there's just no personal story in there to really draw you in and then as i dug i found one recently and i was like ah that's it that's it it's the it's the story that that is not about the thing that we think it's about. It's it's about something else. And uh, I'm researching that at the moment. And it, it, it's really interesting. So that'll be next week's story. I think that'll be quite interesting. Originally, that wasn't going to be in this season. But when I found the bulk of the evidence, I was like, oh, I'm happy now. OK, this this will I'll put this in earlier because this deserves to be in. So I uh, hope that makes sense. Oh, also, sometimes some of these stories are just piss heads. Piss, the, the, there was a murder in Soho not too long ago. Uh, I was going to cover that, but A, there's not very much information because it hasn't gone to court yet. Uh, police are still investigating it. B, it's drunks and druggies. Who cares? You know, I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't care about drunks and druggies, but it's, it's like most of these stories involving drunks and druggies are like they're off their face. They have a fight for a stupid reason. Who cares? You know, there's nothing emotional about it. It's just assholes. Anyway, uh, another question here from Jason Abercrombie. Uh, my question is, what uh, what do you listen? Hang on, is what do you listen to podcast podcast wise? Sorry, <laughs> podcast wise. I love true crime, but the guys at No Such Thing as a Fish are fantastic. I agree. I do enjoy No Such Thing as a Fish. Um, um, I'll be totally honest. I used to be a massive true crime fan, and I'm not not denigrating other true crime podcasts but because i spend like 12 hours a day every day researching and writing true crime uh and then editing it and doing the tours it's basically a seven day a week job at the end of it i just I, my love for true crime is just gone now i just can't be out i just this last thing i want to so the only true crime i listen to now is case file i think case file is really good uh, although I fell asleep during the last one. <laughs> I know people fall asleep during my episodes. Wake up! Wake up! I've done that in case you fell asleep. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, I know people fall asleep during my episodes. I fall asleep during Case File as well. The last one, I, I don't remember any of it. So that's the only uh, true crime I listen to. These are my current shows. So, No Such Thing as a Fish. I enjoy that as well. I think it's really good. Uh, sometimes I, I, I disagree with their research because they use Wikipedia. Mm, uh, they should know better than that. Uh, the uh, the Illusionist is very good. If you, it's about etymology, if you like words, Radio Lab is very good. It's very well structured. Criminal, obviously, that is technically true true crime, but I like it because it's not. 
uh, Mark Marin, WTF. Uh, I enjoy that. I don't understand. I don't know half the people who are on there, but I, I, I like I like him because he's a good interviewer. Because he uh, he doesn't focus on the things that everyone else does. It's like he focuses on the on the things that interest him and the things that interest him aren't the things that interest everyone else so it draws you into a different world like he he just did a really nice uh conversation with john Turturro, uh the actor and it was nice because he didn't all of it wasn't about all oh, your great parts it was about how he started in theater and his love of theater and you know uh, he, uh how his how john Turturro's dad and his mum affected how he became a person so it's quite interesting ear hustle uh, that's not true crime either i wouldn't say but if you've uh, never listened to that give it a go uh based was originally based in san quentin by prisoners one of the prisoners who was uh, on the show has now been released so that makes it more interesting uh revisionist history by malcolm gladwell very good uh richard herring podcast going a bit off that at the moment because he's a bit self-indulgent indulgent. He, he, he i like some of the guests he has on but uh, he, he he turns all the questions on himself like he'll ask a question and it are like, uh, nay, nay, uh, so who are you dating at the moment? Uh, uh, pause, because I dated Julia Sawala. And it's like, oh, we don't need to hear about your fucking life again. Anyway, uh, <laughs> going a bit off it again. I'm, I'm probably going to unsubscribe again. Uh, 99% Invisible. I really like that. That's really good. Uh, Commode on film, Mark Commode, the film critic. That's really good. I really enjoyed that. Uh, Every Little Thing. That's quite good. People call in with uh, odd questions like, uh, do dogs have belly buttons? Uh, and that's really good. Audio long reads by The Guardian. That's good. 20,000 Hertz. I've just got into this now. It's about sound design. Uh, it's it's really interesting. It's about... Uh, they, they did a whole episode about... Uh, background artists so not background artists in films like the people you see in the background but the people who play the voices of the people in the background because obviously the, the background artists have to be silent because it messes up the sound so what they do is they go in and they record uh background hubbub and there's there's a group of people whose job it is just to be background artists but in voice only uh, and it's funny they all got together and it was like they were saying we, we can hear each other's tones in the background of like famous films uh, but they they do different things like where where, where do the, uh, the sounds for uh, uh, like dinosaurs in movies come from it's it's, it's really interesting uh, Hollywood Babylon I really enjoy that it's Ke uh, Kevin Smith and Ralph Garman uh, I love that a bit Ho Hollywood uh, uh, it's just it's just rambling but it, but it's very good I, I do enjoy it uh, obviously my dad wrote a porno that's good This American Life very good Adam Buxton podcast very good the bugle the first podcast i listened to back in 2006 and i'm still listening to it 13 days 13 years later case file obviously uh see i i, I said i don't listen to many but i do uh soundtracking with edith, edith bowman it's about uh uh composers for moves, movies that are really good uh unexplained uh if you like uh, mysteries that's very good uh, british podcast very good atletico mints interesting that i listen to this it's uh, uh it's meant to be a football podcast but it's not a football podcast and i hate football but it's bob mortimer i tuned in i like bob mortimer it's really good fun uh one of my favorites uh attaboy clarence it's made by a fantastic guy called adam roche one of my favorite podcasts go back and listen to the first one it's funny the the, the audio is really shit and even adam says that and uh, oh no it's, it's i think it's the episode with the uh, Brighton Strangler it's either the first one or the second one it's very funny he loses his shit over it but it, it's 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 nice it's about it's about old-timey radio it's about movies from the 20s 30s 40s that you've never heard of do you know but it's it's really nicely done uh, imaginary worlds it's about sci-fi it's fantastic if you like sci-fi give it a go uh, Adam's other podcast this is a beauty this is it's called secret history of Hollywood uh, Adam only releases like an episode once every six months, but you can understand why when you re when you re get a secret hi history of Hollywood episode, it's whew, it's easily like five or six hours long. But it's but kind of like Murder Mile, it's written a bit like a radio play. But Adam knows how to do voices. He's he's got a very nice, beautiful tone to his voice, and he's very a really nice 
storyteller. Everything's really neatly structured, and it really lures you in. And he plays all of the characters incredibly well. I don't know how he does it. It's like he can play four characters in the same scene, and they all sound different. It's like I have no idea how you do that. Maybe he has time to do it. I just I just have to rattle through it because my battery's going to run out on my laptop, or because I'm <laughs> trying to get this done before the. the bloody lawnmower man comes back and disrupts it all i'm sure adam's got a fantastic setup anyway secret history of hollywood really give it a go um uh if you can he's he's put some of them behind a, behind a payball at the moment there were the alfred hitchcock ones he did i'm a massive Hitch hitchcock fan i even have an alfred hitchcock tattoo uh i have a a, a, a a, a, a life mask of Alfred Hitchcock next to my writing desk, right next to me right now. Um, so I know everything there is to know about Hitchcock. Like, I'm a massive fan. And here's his uh, multi-parter on, on Hitchcock. Even I was like, I was like, A, firstly, everything was right. B, I was like, oh, shit, wow, there's stuff in here that I never knew. And, he, and he, you know, he, it's beautifully done. He really draws you into the characters. He makes them real. It's not just on this day such and such made this film it's about it's about the people behind the people making the film so that's really good uh the tip off is good that's about investigative journalists um and i've got cereal in there as well cereal's really good and my other favorite is heavyweight heavyweight uh if you remember the wonder years from many years ago for me it kind of feels like the wonder years it's about a guy trying to solve solve little problems they don't release episodes that often but when they do i think i think they're very good they're really nice so worth listening to so i hope that answered that question sorry about that jason that was a big old answer uh but those are all the podcasts i listen to at the moment i don't have any other ones uh i'm always on the lookout for new ones but i just you know not really interested in true crime anymore unfortunately maybe if i stop doing murder mile i can start listening to true crime again <sighs> who knows right uh the, oh, this was the um letter that started off oh my god who wrote it i didn't put that in was that tracy i think it was it was was it tracy armstrong it could be a tracy armstrong i've written my name in there didn't write your name um i bet lots of us have questions we'd like uh to ask you uh would you consider a special q a minimal episode or maybe answering uh, a listener's question uh per murky mail well this is why i'm doing it here blah, 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 blah. uh here we go uh what is the question oh my question uh do you personally know any london villains any villains uh do i know any london villains no uh not well not as far as i know uh what i do try and do with murder mile is because uh i hang around in soho quite a lot and there's a couple of good pubs in there and you know um hang around in pubs enough and you get chatting to enough people because people know that i do murder mile uh the walks and the podcast people do approach me with different pieces of information so i've got to know people over the years who've lived in soho for like decades and i find that really interesting whether they're villains i don't know the problem is with a lot of people who profess to be villains um it's hard to pin that down it's hard to get the truth really uh especially with people like if, if i've already mentioned this before but with um like with uh episode two so that was the uh tony meller episode uh mad frankie fraser uh cut up tony meller in revenge uh with a knife right put him in hospital didn't kill him but he lost a lot of blood and then he came out right uh mad frankie fraser said he did that i put that into the story that it was mad frankie fraser that did it but obviously there's no proof so i did a little burp then but there's no proof that mad frankie fraser actually did that but that is the most amount of information that I've got. So I had to use that in the story. I probably wouldn't do that now. I think that was my early days. I would probably accept things a lot readier now. But if you look at uh, 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 other people, there's at least 10 people that I've found so far who said that they cut up Mad Frankie Fraser. It's like, this is what villains do. It's like half of them are cowards and they're all they're all big and brassy and they're all like, oh, look at me, I'm a, I'm a gangster, I'm a gangster. Yeah, yeah, and they take credit for all these crimes. But do they go to the police about it and say, hey, I did it. I want full respect for this. No, of course they don't. They sit on their ass like lazy little fuckwits and then they go, oh, yeah, 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 I'm the geezer, I'll cut him up, I'm a, I'm a bad dude. But it's like they can't prove anything. They're not, oh, all mouth and no trousers so um uh i don't know any villains unfortunately uh 
Would I want to? I don't know. I've met people who know villains. I've met people who, who know uh, murderers. That's interesting. I've met uh, obviously met um, uh, murderous families. Uh, haven't met any killers yet so far. I think. I don't know. Hopefully not. Anyway. Cool. That was uh, this episode of Murder Mile. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, cool. Dear, I've spoken for a long time. Time to shut up. So, uh, I'm going to bugger off into town. I'm going to do some shopping. Uh, well, I'm going to do some editing, really. Uh, and that's it. Hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, I will see you all soon. Have yourselves a good week. Teddy bye.